Hello and welcome to Forbidden History Radio, where we explore humanity's hidden history, out-of-place artifacts, lost civilizations, and startling evidence that the truth is being suppressed. So in this hour, we're going to be changing gears and talking about the secret prehistory of America. And to do that, we'll be talking with Frank Joseph, another guest of our show earlier. But let me tell you a little bit about Frank, and we'll get him on. Frank Joseph is the author of a dozen published books about metaphysics, military, and ancient history released in as many foreign languages. A feature writer for Fate... Command and Atlantis Rising magazines, his article about military aviation had been published by the Department of Defense. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Frank Joseph. Hi, Frank. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, not a problem. You know, I think it's very interesting in your bio how you write, you know, military aviation and topics about military and then jump into metaphysics and ancient history and I don't know. My brain just kind of has a hard time wrapping wrapping around both topics. Well, not really, because I believe that uh, our whole species, I was going to say civilization, but I think our whole species is moving towards a kind of an integrated um, mode in which uh, the interconnections amongst so many apparently different things that we thought were so separated in the past, now there are commonalities that are emerging, that there are common themes that link one into the other. And as far as writing about the military, I can uh, tell you that uh, that has a a very strong bearing on what happened in America during prehistory, because there were civilizations that got to the point, they had begun quite well, but they got to the point where they were so uh, consumed with self-gratification with uh, self-indulgence, that they uh, would do anything to uh, keep those endorphins up. And as as a consequence, they uh, became aggressive, imperialistic. Uh, They made war on their neighbors. And uh, in the long run, they destroyed themselves. And so... uh, We wouldn't happen to be talking about Atlantis or anything here. I'm talking about America, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I thought not, I thought we started off imperialistic as soon as we got here. No, no, it, it does, uh, we're headed in that direction now. But and I'm not really talking about America. I'm being rather facetious. I'm talking about trends that are dangerous in our country, and that really uh, even the difference between Atlantis and America begin to to merge because it's part of the human condition. And we have to make a choice. I think that's what uh, history and archaeology are telling us, is that it's important to make a choice between the self-destructive uh, modes of thought that, that begin out of uh, fear and selfishness, or else uh, to go back to those uh, higher principles of being close to nature in every regard that uh, made civilization great when it started. So were you listening to the first hour of the show? Because that's almost exactly what we talked about. Well, that's good confirmation, but I don't want to bore your <laughs> listeners with the same thing. So, uh, be- Well, no, I mean, it was just kind of like, hmm, are you having like a little psychic moment on me there, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> so, <in> your show. <laughs> that's right. You were receiving it on airwaves in your teeth, yeah. <laughs> so you have a new book, Unearthing Ancient America. So when did this come out? Uh, not too long ago, just a later part of last year. It's a collection of what I think are the very best articles that have appeared in our magazine, Ancient American, over the past 18 years or so. And it was my privilege to uh, collect these uh, really outstanding articles and put them into a format that's uh, accessible and easy for people to read like myself who are not professional uh, archaeologists, uh, but were interested in, of course, the where we came from and who we are, what happened on our continent before we got started, and are these energies that were unloosed long ago still working with us? All those are questions that are uh, addressed in Unearthing Ancient America, and it it covers a a very wide spectrum. And There's very little theory in this book. It's mostly uh, hard facts, uh, real strong physical evidence of people who arrived here in large numbers long before Columbus, not 
a couple of dozen years or hundred years, but thousands of years before Columbus. The people swarmed from various parts of the world, from the uh, from West Africa, from North Africa, from uh, Western Europe, from Asia, and made a tremendous, dramatic impact on the prehistory of our continents. And that's basically what the book is about. And it, it presents not just theories, as I say, or somebody's conception of things, but uh, artifacts that were left by these people that are not discussed in the mainstream press. Yeah, so what's with that whole thing? You know, why don't, I mean, you know, I got the book before we even had set up the interview, and I'm like, oh, Frank's got a new book, I'm going to flip through it, and I was like halfway through going, huh, never heard about that, huh, never heard about that, huh, never heard about that. I mean, and I feel that I'm pretty well read, you know, especially in, you know, ancient history and stuff, and I think I heard about two or three things that you talked about in the book. So why why haven't people heard about it? It's not surprising. Uh, there are a great many people who are quite well read and are familiar with, uh, they think, with the history and archaeology to some extent. But their sources of information have been through uh, mainstream uh, press. And the reason why we do not hear about these things is because, believe it or not, there still are claims out on American territory from other parts of the world. And so this is the one of the reasons why these ideas are not discussed. I mean, for example, we know for a fact, and it's one of the articles that are published in the Unearthing Ancient America, that the Portuguese were here before Columbus. Now, they were not here, of course, hundreds or thousands of years before Columbus, but nonetheless, they were here decades before Columbus, at least, a, at least one decade before Columbus. In other words, sometime in the 15th century, uh, they, were, they were here. And what would that do to our relations with Portugal? There are places where Christopher Columbus is regarded as a saint. If you go to Brazil, for example, Christopher Columbus is uh, just about uh, popularly canonized. And when things are found down in Brazil, for example, a Roman wreck was found. A Roman ship was found off the coast of Rio de Janeiro about 15 years ago. It was verified by archaeologists from the University at Maine. Uh, the cargo on board was identified to a uh, collection of uh, amphora or vases that go back to the first century A.D., right around 40 A.D. And when that wreck was found uh, by a fellow by the name of Marx, and he announced it to the Brazilian authorities, they, they uh, pulled a cement barge over the site of the wreck and dumped the cement barge on the wreck. And it is impossible to access that anymore because the uh, paradigm would have been shattered. Uh, no longer would uh, Christopher Columbus be regarded as a saint. Of course, that's Brazil. People think, well, that could never happen here in the United States, but it does happen here. It's not as crude as that, except that information such as we have in ancient America is not discussed on the mainstream television or, or taught in the schools. And Part of the reason is there are outstanding claims on territories in the United States which could theoretically uh, be revived. That's one reason why. Now, the other reason is, is that when you go to school to become an archaeologist, you are told to support the research of, the, of your fellows. And in order to do that, you cannot put out anything that will shake up the, the research of your colleagues because they have a financial investment in the way history is taught. That financial investment is they uh, publish their own textbooks, which they sell to their students. That's part of their income. It's also part of their ego, a big part of their ego. I found that mainstream archaeologists are not simply not interested in the prehistory of America. The only thing they're interested in are uh, tribal histories of uh, various Indian tribes, but when it comes to, for example, like the Adena, which I'm sure our listeners have not heard about, the Adena were a people who are recognized by mainstream archaeologists that burst on the scene in America 3,000 years ago. And these people built pyramids. We're talking about stone pyramids. They introduced agriculture. Um, they were iron workers. They had iron foundries. They came out of nowhere. Genetic testing on some of the people that were related to the Adena or lived in that area in, in Ohio, the Ohio Valley, have revealed that the Adena came from Western Europe, specifically Normandy and France, 
in Ireland and southern Britain, that these were Celtic peoples who were displaced by the advances that Rome was making and sailed the North Atlantic to, in large numbers to create the, the first real high culture here in North America. And in their Ohio? DNA, <laughs> yes, in the Ohio Valley. They settled in the Ohio Valley. And they landed, first of all, of course, along the uh, eastern seaboard and traveled to the Ohio Valley because it was extremely rich agriculturally. And the, the society that they set up, the Adena set up, these are Celtic people now. They set up, it lasted from about 1,000 B.C. all the way to 700 A.D. That's when the last of them were exterminated in wars with the native tribes. These stories have been told amongst Native Americans for many, many years, but it's only been recently, within the last five years, that the DNA testing has revealed that the Adena were, in fact, people from Ireland and southern Britain and northern France, and yet that's not information that is discussed on television. It completely dismantles the paradigm that there was nobody here before Columbus, nobody of any significance. Well, but that's rude. And, you know, that's politically incorrect. You know, what was interesting, I read your book, and one of the stories you talk about is the Kensington Runestone. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and I thought it was an interesting article. And I'm going to let you kind of talk about that here in a second. And when they talked about it, they were like, oh, well, this guy found it in his backyard, ha, ha, supposedly, but it was determined, determined to be a fake. The Kensington Runestone uh, was found uh, by a Swedish immigrant farmer in the middle of Minnesota while he was clearing his land. And as he was pulling up a, a tree, uh, getting a dead tree to get it out of the way of his plow, he found that the roots of the tree were entwined around a large granite boulder. And the boulder was inscribed on three sides with runic script. The runes were used by the Norse, uh, as late as only about 200 years ago in their own language. The runic language goes back uh, many centuries, of course, but it flourished during the time of the Vikings and sometime thereafter. And here he is in Minnesota, and he pulls up this runic text on the side of this great boulder. The runic text was easily read. It was found to be in archaic or older Swedish. And so there's no trouble translating this text. And it tells about an expedition of Swedes who left um, Sweden and made a uh, an exploratory voyage, as it is explained, to the eastern seaboard of the United States, North America, then traveled down the St. Lawrence Seaway. Part of it they had to portage over land because it was not as accessible then as it is now, all the way into the Great Lakes, and made it into uh, Minnesota through a system of rivers which no longer exist river system has been proven to have existed at this time, which is about 1421. Columbus discovered America, 1492. We're talking about 1421. This is beyond the Viking Age, but the Norse were still uh, sailing Viking ships. They were Christianized by that time. They were no longer uh, the Vikings that we know with the uh, so-called horned helmets and things like that, which they never wore anyway. But, so this uh, voyage of discovery tells how when the Swedes arrived in Minnesota in 1421, they were attacked by uh, local tribes, uh, and five of their party were killed, and that the stone was set up as a memorial to those five who died. And it has since been learned that this stone uh, tells about a people who left Sweden, not just for kicks, but they had been commissioned by the king of Sweden, uh, as a place of uh, to find a place of refuge, because in 1421 there was a massive epidemic that was sweeping through uh, northern Europe and was decimating the populations, especially of Scandinavia. And the king of Sweden was looking for some place where he could get away with his royal family, some place far that nobody had uh, heard about, nobody knew about before, get away from all possibilities of contagion. The Kensington runestone, when it was found in 1898, was labeled almost immediately as a fake. So it turns out the uh, farmer had the misfortune to be Swedish, so people thought he was uh, responsible for this Swedish fraud that was in the, with these runic letters. However, as recently as just two years ago, uh, Scott Walford, who is a professional geologist, had access uh, to uh, an extremely high-powered uh, electron microscope. And this is a, I'm cutting to the chase here, but he did a, an electronic mi- microscopic survey of the uh, the runes as they appear on the stone itself, 
the stone that was found in 1898 in Minnesota. And it turns out that the uh, grooves under an electronic microscope reveal that they could only have been carved uh, about 500 years ago, between 500 and about 800 years ago. They were not carved in, re in recent times because of the wear involved. Also, it was found that the um, tool marks made on the stone were not by modern tools, but they were they were not steel tools. They were uh, older iron tools that had been uh, long out of service, no longer used by the time that uh, uh, Olaf Ullman, the discoverer of the stone, found the stone. So the Kensington runestone has been absolutely verified through scientific analysis to be an authentic piece of physical evidence that shows that there were people from northern Europe who had made a voyage of discovery and had penetrated as far as Minnesota in 1421. You're not seeing this in your education. Is this going to rewrite the history books? No, it won't, because the paradigm is still in place. Nobody before Columbus. When you go to school, as I said, you are told that is the nothing is accepted about any overseas visitors to the North American continent before that time period. That is a a what they call an event horizon. Refers to Columbus. Well, you know, you kind of have like Leif Erikson, sort of, but not really. You know, and I just think it's interesting because when you talk about the tablet that was found, you know, that supposedly had a description of work being done in the second temple or the first temple um, in Israel, I mean, everybody jumped on top of that thing and they did all kinds of tests only to find out that it was a fraud. You know, and so why, you know, it just seems like a disparity disparity, you know, in interest where something like that, you know, there are all these scientific minds looking at it and testing it and evaluating it and determining its authenticity. And then something like this, they just immediately say, oh, well, it's fake without really doing any testing. Well, when uh, Scott Walter, the geologist, made his determination that this Kensington runestone is authentic, that it does portray uh, Swedes who arrived in the early part of the 15th century, it did make the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And they did wow. present some of his evidence. <laughs> However, uh, they immediately, on and, and the newspaper, they went to, to a mainstream archaeologist who completely condemned the entire uh, stone as a fraud, made a big joke of it, and most of the article was about how the uh, state archaeologist thought the thing was really quite funny, but uh, the state archaeologists had been presented by Scott Walter with their findings. Uh, he, the state ar archaeologist took no interest in it whatsoever. They, they have the attitude that because nobody could have been here before 1492, nobody was here. And that mindset absolutely predominates. And you're it's impossible to convince these people. The only way that there's going to be this new history that we're talking about and that the book is all about will really be accepted is when this present generation of um, academics has passed away. There are some archaeologists now, younger ones, as it turns out, in, uh, in their 30s and 40s, who are taking a serious look at this information now and are, are not condemning it uh, in, in, as a complete uh, fraud. Uh, we've had, as uh, shockingly, uh, not this issue of Ancient American, but the one just before it, the last issue of 2008, we were contacted by the archaeological department at, um, at, at the Field Museum in Chicago, which is a major archaeological institution, and they were uh, very sympathetic. They helped us out with a lot of great new finds that they showed us. Uh, they gave us fabulous photographs, which we were able to put in our magazine for free, uh, just to get out their uh, information. And they had no trouble associating uh, with our magazine. Before, when Ancient American first came out in 1993, oh, the archaeologists regarded it as, uh, well, I think somebody once said, a scientific pornography. Uh, mm. Something not to be examined. <laughs> uh, you know. so, but it, it's kind of funny that they chose that word because I... I knew for a fact years afterwards that there were many archaeologists who were reading our magazine in secret. So be just like, uh, you know, going some, and getting uh, an inquirer, <laughs> right? Some some wicked little little kid, you know, going in the closet reading a Playboy magazine or something. It's on that same level. <laughs> but uh, there are uh, there is definitely a change, a shift going on, and uh, I think that our book, Unearthing Ancient America, 
has got to get a lot of these uh, skeptics uh, thinking, at least halfway of an open mind anyway. But the Kensington well, runestone is absolutely hard proof, uh, granite proof, that uh, there was a uh, an expedition that did penetrate as far as Minnesota that long ago. Well, and there, you know, it would be one thing if it was one thing, you know, just that one stone. But, I mean, the book is just filled with story after story after story after story of different things. And, you know, all they would need to do is investigate one or two, you know, like one of my personal favorites, which I just kind of shook my head at, was the underground city of the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah. You know, that is a Roman. so... You know, and I just and so if you could talk a little bit about that whole find, because I was just like, what underground city of the Grand Canyon? And, you know, people have gone there and it's not in any of the tour maps. No. uh, And the reason why it's not in the tour maps is because it's in a very dangerous area of the Grand Canyon. Um, The story was that uh, somebody had found an underground city in the Grand Canyon and that this guy had been associated with the Smithsonian Institution of all all groups. And um, so this is pretty interesting, and that's about all we knew sometime in the early 20th century. So we telephoned the Smithsonian Institution and said, what about this? And I said, oh, we get calls every once in a while from people say that supposedly this Egyptian city was found in the um, Grand Canyon, but it was it's all a hoax. It's, you know, we don't know anything about it whatsoever. So... We did some research into this story, and we found that there was a fellow by the name of G.E. Kincaid, who was a photographer, a professional photographer for the Smithsonian, and had been, in fact, hired by the Smithsonian in the year 1908 to make the first photographic record of the Grand Canyon. Uh, he had already been hired by the, by the Smithsonian for other projects. <clears throat> and he was, as Kincaid was of the level of Ansel Adams. He was one of these great nature photographers. And in late 1908, Kincaid by himself set out in a boat down the Colorado River to photograph the Grand Canyon. He, had only, he was only the second human being to have ever been through the northern part of the Grand Canyon. Not even the Native Americans would go there because they regarded this area of the Grand Canyon as cursed. And one reason why is because it's extremely dangerous. It's a very treacherous area. And it's forbidden for people to go into this day because it's very hard to rescue people. You cannot get a permit to go in there. So Kincaid is going down the river making his photographs when he sees, to his amazement, up the side of a of a mountain, of a, a mountainous area, actually, a cliff, uh, a set of uh, what appear to be uh, steps, a grand staircase carved on the side of this mountain. So he docks his boat and he pulls up and uh, walks up the side of this mountain and in fact finds that here is a grand flight of steps, stone steps. What's amazing, of course, about this is that so far as is known, no one had ever been there. And he was the, like I said, only the second person known to have gone through the Grand Canyon, the first photographer. So he, he climbs the steps. And the steps lead up to the side of a, uh, the mountain, which opens up into a cave, a cavern, actually, a large cavernous mouth. And uh, he enters the cavern. He brings along with him uh, his uh, uh, facilities, his lights and so forth, and he makes a tremendous discovery. Okay, let's save the discovery till after the break. Before we went to break, we were talking about the... Uh underground cave in the Grand Canyon and you were just getting to the part where you were talking about what he found when he went into the cave. Kincaid uh, stepped up to the mouth of the cave and with his lantern he entered and he found uh, what he recognized immediately as not just a cave but as a man-made corridor. Uh, The lines of this uh, subterranean excavation were dead straight And he found a a network, a honeycomb of corridors that led in various directions. The cave uh, enclosed, like I said, a kind of a network. The uh, corridors led to various chambers, all of them quite large. The largest chamber was more than a chamber. It was an absolute room. He compared it to a kind of a cafeteria in which there were stone benches and what looked like uh, eating utensils. 
Uh, next to the uh, large cafeteria was a, what appeared to be a dormitory. The most remarkable structure that he found, though, was an also a very large room, a, ch a chamber, very high, domed. All this is now cut inside the, the mountainside. And in this one circular room that he found, there was at the center a circular altar. And around the base of the altar were, as he described it, about a dozen or so figurines, uh, carved statuettes that resembled uh, little demonic dancing uh, creatures. On top of the uh, circular altar, the dais, was uh, a larger than life size representation of an anthropomorphic figure that kind of resembled a, uh, a dwarf, perhaps, or uh, some kind of a, a human being with its uh, tongue extended. He said that it looked like uh, something from either Egypt or India. Uh, Kincaid was an excellent photographer, but he didn't know anything about uh, archaeology. He was not trained as a, a cultural anthropologist or anything like that. He made photographs of everything, and um, he took nothing. He did have enough sense for that. He disturbed absolutely nothing. He found also uh, there were large piles of bronze weapons, edged weapons, uh, lances, spears, shields, um, everything stacked very neatly, just left there. He said the entire place uh, looked like it was extremely old. Kincaid uh, left this um, site, continued on his assignment, uh, finished his uh, photographic journey, and when he was met by reporters from um, the Arizona Gazette, which was a major newspaper, is still, still today a major newspaper, he told uh, what he had found. It made front page coverage of the Arizona Gazette and a number of other newspapers. Uh, the source for all this information I'm giving you is primarily from the Arizona Gazette. Um, some people have said, well, it was just like uh, perhaps it was like a, an April Fool's joke or something like that. But that's not true because after the lead article came out, the front page article on Kincaid's finding of this underground city, uh, there were subsequent articles in the same newspaper which told what happened afterwards. The Smithsonian uh, w uh, was contacted by wire by uh, Kincaid, and they dispatched a... Uh, their own expedition, led by a fellow by the name of Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N. And Jordan, uh, with about uh, four of his colleagues, met up with Kincaid. They went back down the river. He, Kincaid took them to the same site. They entered, and they made a kind of a small railroad, uh, uh, railroad with uh, railroad carts on it, and they literally carted out hundreds and hundreds of artifacts. After the artifacts were removed and they set up a great iron gate that covered over the mouth of this uh, cavern and they padlocked it and put uh, iron bolts in front of it. When I confronted the uh, Smithsonian with this story and what we had learned, uh, they said they didn't know anything about it and that uh, they didn't have any records for anybody ever working for the Smithsonian by the name of Jordan. Well, it was very interesting because I had found an article in a copy of the Smithsonian Magazine for 1926 with an article by Mr. Jordan. <laughs> the same fellow they said had never existed. Not only that, but I got a chance to, uh, through our research, I, I found out the great-grandson of the photographer, Kincaid, and said, of course Mr. Kincaid existed. He was my great-grandfather, and we still have a lot of his photographs. Any photographs of him in the cave? No, none of that. Since that time, there have been several individuals who have heard this story and have researched it as, as we have, who, try, who have tried to find that, that spot. Several have succeeded. And they all report the same thing, that it's in an extremely remote and dangerous area, the north end of the canyon, that it is in fact uh, uh, still padlocked as a great iron gate. It looks very old. Of course, it was set up in 1909. And uh, they have motion detectors there, which means the, the park district has set up motion detectors because people are not allowed in that area. There are stories well, and that about means people. that someone's been there fairly recently. Yes, yes, on. absolutely, absolutely. Um, we talked to some tourists not too long ago, uh, some uh, gals who went out to that same area uh, and saw it from a distance. And, and through their binoculars were able to see it. But they couldn't get to it because it was, like I said, it was very difficult to get to. So it, it does definitely exist. And interestingly enough, that area, if you go um, to, let's say, any kind of a, a map of the Grand Canyon and you look on the north end, the extreme north end, it's very curious that all of the, form, all of the formations in that area 
have Egyptian style names. Who put uh, like uh, one of the uh, uh, formations there is called the Temple of Horus. Another one is called uh, uh, I- the Isis Shrine. There, there must be about a dozen of these names. You wonder, like, well, what generated these rather Egyptian sounding names? Now, who could have done this? Uh, who was responsible for this culture? Uh, from Kincaid's description, it, it either was ancient Egyptian or Hindu. There is an Egyptian god. His name was Bess. And the Egyptians worshipped him as a, uh, or they regarded him as sort of the deity of entertainment, as it were. He was a dwarf. He's portrayed in temple art with his tongue extended. And that kind of fits with what Kincaid said, because here's this statue of this dwarfish figure with his tongue extended, and around the bottom of his uh, altar, Kincaid said, were a number of these uh, figures that seemed to be dancing. So it appears as though uh, that this wasn't an ancient Egyptian uh, impact made on the southwest of the United States. It, it is not alone by any means. There are tremendous amount of physical evidence that back this story up, uh, in, at least in regards as ancient Egyptians being in the Americas. Uh, the most uh, shocking, I think, and the most irrefutable was the discovery of about 10 years ago uh, of large amounts, not trace amounts, but large amounts of cocaine in Egyptian mummies. Uh, in the early 1990s, there was um, a project undertaken at the Cairo Museum to investigate some of the mummies using some of the DNA uh, technology that was just coming out. And as they were, as the investigators were uh, beginning to uh, operate on the mummies, they were shocked to find uh, large traces of tobacco and especially cocaine. Now that's interesting to find that in the mummies because cocaine. It all grows in South America? Only in South America. Only in South America. No cocaine ever grown anywhere in Africa at all, certainly not anywhere near Egypt. Now, well, and tobacco is indigenous to the United States or to the Western Hemisphere, isn't it? Right, right. Now, what are these mum? And these mummies represented a tremendous time span. They went all the way from about uh, 2,500 BC, in other words, at the time the Great Pyramid was made, all the way up to the very close, almost the close of Egyptian civilization, like about maybe a 100 BC, something like that. Uh, that is remarkable. Why would these people be in? interested the ancient Egyptians in cocaine. The Egyptians were an extremely uh, spiritualized people, highly I spiritualized. I think of a lot of reasons. <laughs> well, uh, it, it does not, it, it, the interesting thing is that the cocaine traces that were found in the mummies were all of uh, either priests or upper class people. And that's because cocaine was probably administered uh, by high priests to achieve an altered state of consciousness, part of a, uh, being with the gods. Uh, We know that the ancient Greeks did precisely the same thing with drugs, although they never used cocaine. They didn't have access to it. But this is strong, hard evidence to show that, yes, there was regular uh, visits between the ancient Egyptians. And, of course, we're talking about South America. We're talking about Peru and Bolivia. But they did not stop that. What great excuse did they use for that one? What great excuse did they use for that? It's a joke. Yeah. What they, their response was, uh, now we're talking about, they, I'm referring to the skeptics of this when they're confronted with it. If it had just been one or two, that would have been interesting enough, but there are literally dozens, possibly hundreds of Egyptian mummies that have strong traces of, co- of cocaine. And their, their response was, well, there must have been some modern Egyptian curator there who was taking cocaine at the time that he was investigating these mummies, and some of the cocaine must have somehow spilled into the uh, corpse, the, the mummy corpse. I mean, it's just, a, you know, it beggars the imagination that uh, the, the contortions they go through to uh, just completely debunk uh, their attempts to debunk these finds. And, That's a uh, good one, though. I, I like that. That just makes. So, in other go- words. You know, huh? what, what, <laughs> what happened, though, of course, it was that the curators at the Egyptian Museum were outraged because they're, they're being accused of being all cokeheads at the, <laughs> at the museum in, in Cairo. You know, it's, it's preposterous. We found that mainstream archaeologists do not have 
the mindset. I mean, it's like they're emotionally unequipped <laughs> to deal with the with these uh, finds. I myself am not an archaeologist. I am a reporter. My background is in journalism. And when I went to school, I was told uh, as a young journalist student that in order to find the truth, whatever it is, you find cross-references. You find evidence, and then you try to cross-reference the evidence. Well, that's what we've been doing in Asian American, and the, the truth is pretty obvious. But that cocaine, uh, that is, I think, one of the most irrefutable uh, finds ever, and yet it's never discussed, except in our magazine, in our book, but it's not discussed, uh, I don't see it discussed on television or mainstream media at all, or certainly not in our, our schools. And then there was an Egyptian statuette that we talk about, you may have seen that in Unearthing Ancient America, a beautiful little Egyptian statuette was taken out of an Indian mound in Libertyville, Illinois. That's about 40 miles north of the city of Chicago. About 70 years ago, a fellow was digging into Indian mounds. In those days, it wasn't illegal. You're looking for treasure or souvenirs or whatever. And around this little lake in an extremely remote area, a very undeveloped area in those days. Right now, it's just a, a big uh, a suburb. But uh, back in the 1930s, it was just a little farming community of that. And this fellow was about 17 or 18, and he had dug into this Indian mound. There were many there. Indian mounds are all over the the Midwest, a lot of them in Illinois. And here, lo and behold, he comes up with this beautiful little statuette. It's about 18 inches from top to bottom, and it represents a man in a kind of a mummy garb, although his face is exposed. And in one hand, he's holding the, the crook, and the other is the flail. Those are the emblems of uh, royalty, uh, Egyptian royalty. The crook, the shepherd's crook, that was to signify his uh, authority over the, mat, the flocks of his people. And the flail was to show the, his ability to inflict uh, judgment, the power to do that. This little uh, statuette, when we researched it, we found that it is known as Anushapti. It's an ancient Egyptian word for a, uh, a grave good that was interred with the this person who died, it was believed that the Ushapti contained the spirit of a helper, of an assistant, so that when the person, uh, the spirit of the person was entombed, the the little Ushapti, the little statue, would come alive and help the deceased uh, with all of their uh, problems on the on the other side, as it were, in the next world. We also so found was there any. Um hieroglyphics or any kind of, you know, other than the form of it, was there any other identifiers that would show that it was Egyptian? Yes, as a matter of fact, there, there is a little, a brief little text, and it fits perfectly with what I've been describing, because the little text that's on the Ushapti is a, a kind of a magic formula from what is known as the Book of the Dead. And the Book of the Dead was, uh, many times, was uh, buried, copies were buried with the deceased, because it was like an instruction manual on what to do when you get on the other side. Um, and this Ushapti specifically dates to 600 B.C. We, we found that, not through carbon dating or anything like that, we found that through its style, the style of its manufacturer. And it took us a while, but we were able to identify it as being specifically made in 600 B.C. Now, that is really neat because in 600 B.C., there was an Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Nekau, N-E-K-N-E-K-A-W, who sponsored long-distance travel by ships. Well, doesn't that just work that way? Frank, we need to take another break. Frank, if you had to pick one story out of the book, which would be your favorite? Well, one of my favorite is a story that came out just about two years ago, uh, just as we were putting the book together. And that's about uh, a, a mound that was excavated in Norway. It was a typical Viking mound. It was a small one. hadn't been seen before. And when the mound was opened, they found three skeletons. Uh, two of the skeletons were easily identified. They were of a Norse, Nordic people. One was of an older man. Another was of a child. There were uh, Viking grave goods, and the mound was easily dated to about uh, 900 A.D., in other words, right in the middle of the Viking Age. Viking Age began about 800 A.D., lasted to maybe 1200 A.D., so this is like 
right in the, the middle of this. However, one of the skeletons proved very problematical. It belonged to an older man, a tall man, and uh, they did not recognize the, the, the cranium, the skull of this fellow. He was definitely not Norse, not Nordic, not Scandinavian whatsoever. In fact, uh, he wasn't a European at all. And when the, the, uh, the skeletal remains were uh, taken to uh, the university at Oslo, uh, they were shocked to find that the skeleton belonged to an Indian from Peru. And they, the bones belonged to, obviously, somebody who was part of the uh, pre-Inca culture, who had been taken from, uh, taken, or, or we don't know the story, volunteered, whatever, uh, there's no indication that he was um, maltreated in any way. It looked as though he had been well fed, and he was put in a mound, which was an honorable way to be interred. So it looks as though he was a friend that the Vikings had made when they were down in Peru, 900 A.D. How else did this skeleton get into this pristine mound? This is, a, I think, another example of... Uh, physical uh, proof, not just evidence, but proof that there was contact between uh, the Vikings of uh, Scandinavia all the way down to uh, South America. And we're talking about, again, Peru and, and uh, Bolivia. Okay, but, but so what did they say? How did he get there this time? Uh, there, to the 747? Is... I mean, you know... They put him in there after. Uh, you no, know. no. When uh, we have found that when uh, archaeologists are presented with uh, incontrovertible evidence such as this, uh, they sit, they just ignore it. It's not discussed. It's not brought up. Uh, if you collar them and you bring this information to them, they just shrug, and it's not important to them. It's it. They have, as I say, this mindset, this paradigm that there simply wasn't anything before Columbus. And they'll say, well, there must be some explanation for it. Well, okay, so I, Columbus, if it was in Norway, how did this Indian person end up there? Obviously, the only way he ended up in a grave which is 1,100 years old is because he had been taken from South America on board a Viking ship. There's, there's no other uh, possible explanation for this. There's no intrusion in the burial. Besides, who would be so foolish as to dig up an old mound that nobody had ever seen before and put these bones from an Indian in there? I mean, it's not like there's some cultural diffusionist out there trying to make the isolationists look bad, you know. Um, but what I like this particular uh, story, not only because it's uh, incontrovertible, but because it also shows um, a, a reverse. We're not finding now only just uh, people from the ancient old world in America. We're actually finding uh, people from uh, prehistoric times in America in Europe. So this means that there was definite commerce going on, relationships going on. And as I say, the Indian had been buried honorably in this grave. To be put into a mound in those days was not for common people. The common people were cremated or put in uh, very simple uh, graves. A mound was a place of great honor and respect, so it shows that uh, it's not as though he was dra dragged as a slave or some Hollywood scenario. He had the obviously. cocaine, Frank. Come yeah, on. maybe he had. We, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know that the Vikings were involved in that, but the Egyptians <laughs> certainly were. But I really like that that little story, and it's something that like it was a small story um, that we found in the Norwegian Post. Uh, which is, of course, a news, uh, newspaper from Norway. It was a big story over in uh, Norway, but uh, it didn't make it over here, except uh, you had to get up on the web, and then we checked it out. We did follow up on it. It was absolutely true. We talked to the university. Yes, we have the bones, and yeah, this is definitely an Indian, and we can identify him as coming from... matter of fact, they even identify him as coming from a certain area of Peru along the coast. How's that fit? I mean, it fits perfectly. There was a coastal Indian from South America, and the Vikings obviously befriended him and said, come on, let's go. Want to, want to check out and see how life is back in, the, in Norway? We're sure. We took off. That's what happened. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing story. And it's not that unique. That so though. cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, here it, it's funny. Huh? That's the only evidence I, I'm familiar with where somebody from the ancient Americas has actually been found in, in Europe. Mostly it's, of course, the other way. But uh, who knows what, what else is there to be found? Or what has been found that we just haven't heard about. Or destroyed. 
Uh, we know that the Smithsonian has been involved in the wholesale destruction of uh, uncomfortable evidence, such as we say. So, but this one at least uh, is preserved, and the Scandinavians are a little more open to these things than they are in America. Or that one of the greatest discoveries, of course, was back in uh, 1985. It's quite a while ago, where a scuba diver found a castle sitting under 70 feet, 75 feet of water off the coast of Japan. And it was since uh, verified by Professor Masakai Kumura, one of the, a world-class geologist, and his students. They examined it for three or five years, and they said, yes, this is a man-made citadel. They referred to it as a citadel, a kind of a castle. Sitting We're talking the about the Yamaguchi and it's, it's Yonaguni is the name of the place. Yeah. It's a very small little island, and, uh, you know, but you won't see that. Yeah, but then there was the American guy who his name eludes me in the moment, but that did the work on the Sphinx, who went there and totally poo-pooed that it was man-made. Which well, it's funny that you're referring to Dr. Robert Schock. Yeah, uh, that guy. Has, right. Uh, Dr. Schock uh, is about one of about, I think, eight or ten geologists and professional university-trained people that have seen it, and he's changed his mind on that. So <laughs> it's, it's not quite as bad as it seems. Frank, there is the music, which means we have to go. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing stories from your book. It was an interesting book. I really enjoyed it. And if you want to get more information, I'm assuming Amazon, etc., etc. That's right. Amazon.com will have Unearthing Ancient America. Perfect. Thanks again, Frank. I'll have to have you on when you write another book. Okay. Keep in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hello and welcome to Forbidden History Radio, where we explore humanity's hidden history, out-of-place artifacts, lost civilizations, and startling evidence that the truth is being suppressed. So in this hour, we're going to be changing gears and talking about the secret prehistory of America. And to do that, we'll be talking with Frank Joseph another guest of our show earlier, but let me tell you a little bit about Frank, and we'll get him on. Frank Joseph is the author of a dozen published books about metaphysics, military, and ancient history released in as many foreign languages. A feature writer for Fate, Command, and Atlantis Rising magazines, his article about military aviation had been published by the Department of Defense. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Frank Joseph. Hi, Frank. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, not a problem. You know, I think it's very interesting in your bio how you write, you know, military aviation and topics about military and then jump into metaphysics and ancient history. And I don't know. I'm not really talking about America. I'm being rather facetious. I'm talking about trends that are dangerous in our country and that really uh, even the difference between Atlantis and America begin to, to merge because it's part of the human condition. And we have to make a choice. I think that's what uh, history and archaeology are telling us, is that it's important to make a choice between the self-destructive uh, modes of thought that, that begin out of uh, fear and selfishness, or else uh, to go back to those uh, higher principles of being close to nature in every regard that uh, made civilization great when it started. So were you listening to the first hour of the show? Because that's almost exactly what we talked about. Well, that's good confirmation, but I don't want to bore your <laughs> listeners with the same thing. So, uh, be- Well, no, I mean, it was just kind of like 
Hmm. Are you having like a little psychic moment on me there, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> Channeling so, your show. <laughs> that's right. You are receiving it on airwaves in your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> So you have a new book, Unearthing Ancient America. So when did this come out? Uh, not too long ago, just a later part of last year. It's uh, a collection of what I think are the very best articles that have appeared in our magazine, Ancient American, over the past uh, 18 years or so. And it was my privilege to uh, collect these uh, really outstanding articles and put them into a format that's uh, accessible and easy for people to read like myself who are not professional uh, the book. So why why haven't people heard about it? It's not surprising. Uh, there are a great many people who are quite well read and are familiar with, uh, they think, with the history and archaeology to some extent. But their sources of information have been through uh, mainstream uh, press. And the reason why we do not hear about these things is because, believe it or not, there still are claims out on American territory from other parts of the world. And so this is the one of the reasons why these ideas are not discussed. I mean, for example, we know for a fact, and it's one of the articles that are published in the Unearthing Ancient America, that the Portuguese were here before Columbus. Now, they were not here, of course, hundreds or thousands of years before Columbus, but nonetheless, they were here decades before Columbus, at least a, at least one decade before Columbus. In other words, sometime in the 15th century, uh, they were they were here. And what would that do to our relations with Portugal? There are places where Christopher Columbus is regarded as a saint. If you go to Brazil, for example, Christopher Columbus is uh, just about uh, popularly canonized. And when things are found down in Brazil, for example, a Roman wreck was found, a Roman ship was found off the coast of Rio de Janeiro about 15 years ago. It was verified by archaeologists from the university. My brain just kind of has a hard time wrapping, wrapping around both topics. Well, not really, because I believe that uh, our whole species, I was going to say civilization, but I think our whole species is moving towards a kind of an integrated um, mode in which uh, the interconnections amongst so many apparently different things that we thought were so separated in the past, now there are commonalities that are emerging, that there are common themes that link one into the other. And as far as writing about the military, I can uh, tell you that uh, that has a, a very strong bearing on what happened in America during prehistory because there were civilizations that got to the point they had begun quite well but they got to the point where they were so uh, consumed with self-gratification with uh, self-indulgence that they uh, would do anything to uh, keep those endorphins up and as, as a consequence they uh, became aggressive imperialistic uh, they made war on their neighbors and uh, in the long run, they destroyed themselves. And so... Uh, the we wouldn't have to be talking about Atlantis or anything here. I'm talking about America, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I thought I thought we started off imperialistic as soon as we got here. No, no. It, it does, uh, we're headed in that direction now. But, and I'm not an archaeologist, uh, but we're interested in, of course, the where we came from and who we are, what happened on our continent before we got started, and are these energies that were unloosed long ago still working with us? All those are questions that are uh, addressed in Unearthing Ancient America, and it, it covers a, a very wide spectrum. And there's very little theory in this book. It's mostly uh, hard facts, uh, real strong physical evidence of people who arrived here in large numbers long before Columbus, not uh, a couple of dozen years or hundred years, but thousands of years before Columbus, the people swarmed from various parts of the world, from the uh, from West Africa, from North Africa, from uh, Western Europe, from Asia, and made a tremendous, dramatic impact on the prehistory of our continents. And that's basically what the book is about. And it, it presents not just theories, as I say, or somebody's conception of things, but uh, artifacts that were left by these people that are not discussed in the mainstream press. Yeah, so what's with that whole thing? You know, why don't, I mean, 
you know, I got the book before we even had set up the interview, and I'm like, oh, Frank's got a new book. I'm going to flip through it. And I was like halfway through going, huh? Never heard about that. Huh? Never heard about that. Huh? Never heard about that. I mean, and I feel that I'm pretty well read, you know, especially in, you know, ancient history and stuff. And I think I heard about two or three things that you talked about.